the Ambassador Series is brought to you in part by Prairie Heart Institute. The University of Illinois at Springfield. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Ambassador Series. My name is Paul Palazzolo, your Sangamon County Auditor and a volunteer for WSEC, and I'll be serving as your host for today's program. This program is a presentation of WSCC-TV in cooperation with the University of Illinois Springfield. The television portion of the program is sponsored in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the support of the viewers of WSCC-TV. It will be broadcast by WSCC and other PBS stations throughout the state. And we encourage you to support WSCC-TV Springfield so that they can continue to bring you programs like this and others that educate, inspire, and entertain. Please allow me to introduce our head table to you today. To my right, your left, is Dr. Jerry Grabel, President and CEO at WSCC Television. To your right, is Crystal McDonald, wife of our honored guest today. And Crystal has also worked in diplomacy here and abroad. She is a senior researcher for the Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy. Also, Dr. Susan Cook, University of Illinois Vice President and Chancellor of UIS, and our featured program for today. Retired Ambassador John W. McDonald is a lawyer, diplomat, former international civil servant, expert in development, and peace builder. He has spent 20 years of his career in Western Europe and the Middle East and worked for 16 years on United Nations economic and social affairs. After 40 years in the U.S. Foreign Service, he became a law professor at the George Washington University and then the first president of the Iowa Peace Institute from 1988 to 1992. He serves on the advisory board of George Mason University's School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution and regularly teaches a course on conflict resolution and post-war peace building at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. In 1982, he founded the non-governmental organization Global Water, and he is deeply involved in the UN Millennium Goals for Clean Drinking Water and Sanitation. Ambassador McDonald holds both a BA and JD degree from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and graduated from the National War College in 1967. I think it's also important to note that in 2006, he was awarded with the University of Illinois Alumni Achievement Award. He has written and co-edited 10 books and numerous articles and makes more than 100 speeches per year. He was appointed twice by President Carter and twice by President Reagan to represent the U.S. at various U.N. World Conferences, and the University of Massachusetts features a graduate school and an annual award bearing his name. Please welcome Ambassador John W. McDonald. Ambassador, Thank you. welcome, Thank you. sir. Thank you. You're on. I'm on. <laughs> Well, it's a great honor to be with you this afternoon. I appreciate that uh, rather lengthy introduction. I want to tell you a bit about the lady on my left, uh, your new chancellor, who some of you have known since she arrived on 1st of July of this year, but I have known since 1989 uh, when I was the president of the Iowa Peace Institute. My first program uh, with the Iowa Peace Institute was to develop a statewide uh, peer mediation project. Peer mediation is to train the teachers, to train the kids how to solve problems on the ground by themselves. And uh, she took the first training uh, in 1989 and we became a, a statewide institution. Uh, she then went back to the University of Northern Iowa where she was a professor and she actually set up a program at her university which provides about half of the teachers to the state of, of Iowa. And she said, you have to take a peer mediation program 
during your course so you graduate into the system already knowing what this concept is all about. So she's an activist. She gets things done. I wanted to share that with you. Then two and a half years into that program, we had about 800 uh, parents uh, in a gymnasium for day's events to uh, watch how their kids were doing. And our three keynote speakers were eighth graders. Have you ever been to a conference where keynote speakers were eighth graders? I don't think so. The third speaker was African-American uh, from Des Moines. And by the time she'd finished telling her story, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And as I was meeting with this young eighth grader, Susan came out of the stands without my even knowing she was there, came up to this young woman and said, I want to offer you a four-year college scholarship to our university. She's a compassionate woman. That's a great story about what her heart is all about. So I want to honor her by giving her a round of applause. <laughs> Today is the December the 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. I remember when I was a junior at the University of Illinois, my fraternity house, on that Sunday morning, we suddenly heard over the radio that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. It was an amazing moment in the house and in the campus, in the nation, and in the world. A, a major turning event. Actually, within 48 hours after that news, one third of our fraternity left the university and signed up for the military. We declared war on Japan. A few days later, uh, Germany uh, and uh, Italy declared war on the United States, and suddenly we were in the middle of World War II. That event is viewed negatively across the world, but actually from an historical point of view, it projected us as a nation into the world scene and finally led to our current position as the number one and only superpower in the world today. I want to leave three thoughts with you about the state of the world today and how we got where we are. If you go back in history 100 years or more, you realize that the world was dominated by 10 great empires. At the end of World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the German Empire. At the end of World War II, it was the Japanese. And then in the next 20 to 25 years, was a British, French, Dutch, Belgian, Portuguese, collapsed, and in 91, the last of the 10, the Soviets. That has had a major impact on where we are today in connection with world history. So in 1945, there were only 51 nations in the world, and they signed the Charter of the United Nations in 1945. Today, there are 193 nations who are members of the United Nations. Between 1951 and, and today's date, 193, and, and it was just a few months ago that South Sudan became the 193rd nation. That means that about two-thirds of the nations of the world are less than 50 years old. So many of them are struggling to find their way. It's not an easy path to follow to become a democracy. But when you put that in perspective, you realize that we are a world in, in transition. The second thought I wanted to leave with you was what happened to me when I was invited to Moscow in 1989. Members of the recently elected Supreme Soviet, the first free election in 70 years, invited me to come and talk about something that they'd heard about but didn't understand it was called conflict resolution. And I realized that there was no word in the Russian language for conflict resolution. And actually, under the Soviets, they didn't need it. They had the gulags and the firing squads. And <laughs> so there was no word. So I came up with the word conflictology. And that word is stuck. And so I have lectured at St. Petersburg and Tbilisi, Georgia, at institutes for conflictology uh, in that part of the world. But uh, 
within two minutes after I had met with uh, a dozen members of the Supreme Soviet, they asked me to solve the Nagorno-Karabakh problem that Stalin had set up in the Caucasus in the 1920s, and I laughed and I said, I can't do that. I said, uh, you need to find a neutral third party, uh, somebody outside of Russia, and they finally ended up with the Office of Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, and they're still working on the problem. Uh, so it's not an easy one to solve, but I had their attention by this time. And I said, gentlemen, they were all men, I estimate that there are 70 ethnic conflicts below the surface of your empire. And you're responsible for the potential conflict there because you've denied three non-negotiable issues. First of all, you demanded that everybody in your empire speak Russian. You don't allow them to speak their native language. It's a crime to speak your native language. I said, that's too strict a rule. You've got to change the rules. Relax the rules. They're not going to hurt you. The second non-negotiable issue was about religion. The Soviet Empire was an atheist empire, an atheist empire for 70 years. No religion of any kind was allowed to be practiced. And if you practiced your own religion and you were caught, you went to prison. I said, people have practiced their own religion since time began. Relax the rules. Let them do what they want to do. They're not going to hurt you. And the third non-negotiable issue is about cultural, about identity. I said you've tried to destroy the identity of these 70 ethnic groups by denying them their birth and marriage and death ceremonies, their art, their music, their dance, their literature. Relax the rules. They want to like, retain their identity as a people. And if you change those rules, they would be helpful. But I said, if you don't change them, and all three at the same time take place, which is now beginning to happen, and you deny language, religion, and culture, you're 100% guaranteed to have violence. And you don't want that. So change the rules. I said, you have the power to do that. All of these decisions are political. And you're now the newly elected parliament change the rules and you have a more peaceful empire. My third idea I wanted to share with you is about the whole concept of national sovereignty. Now national sovereignty was started about 360 years ago at the Treaty of Westphalia. That's what the whole world has been involved in for all these hundreds of years. The Charter of the United Nations is based on national sovereignty. Chapter seven of the Charter uh, says that sanctions can be imposed on one nation when they start to invade another nation. It's all about the nation-state system, one nation invading another and going to war. And that's what the Charter is all about. The problem is that today, in 2011, all of the conflicts in the world, or about, about 40 of them, are within the nation-state. They're intra-state conflict not inter-state conflict. So we're not designed as a world to cope with those conflicts. The best example of that is Mr. Brashear in Sudan, when genocide was taking place in Darfur, Darfur, Sudan, started about six years ago, and nothing happened because he said, he ignored that, he said, I don't want the UN or anybody else to come in, and so people were mur murdered and killed and and a, a terrible impact on the people of Sudan itself. So national sovereignty is supreme across the world. So there's a vacuum out there. What do you do with conflicts that are internal which are not being looked after? And out of that vacuum, small non-governmental organizations like my Institute for Multi-Track Diplomacy began to try to fill in uh, that vacuum. If you look at your program, it's a very nice program, by the way. There is on the third page uh, our logo. Uh, and uh, you'll see that track one is government. Track one uh, is the government to government interactions in the field of foreign affairs. Uh, track two is everything outside of government. I wrote the first book on citizen diplomacy, track two diplomacy when I was with the State Department and 
that I wrote this in 1985. It was a revolutionary document then, and it still is to this day, unfortunately. Then I expanded it to five tracks a few years later, and in 1991, Dr. Louise Diamond and I wrote a book called Multi-Track Diplomacy, and that's what that logo is about. So it took about six years to evolve this whole process. So track three is the role of the business community. Now that's a very critical role, and many of you can be involved in that role because you have the know-how, you have the skills, but you have to understand uh, how you can be, make a major impact in the world today with regard to conflict resolution. Track four is citizen exchange programs like the State Department's International Visitors Program, which brings ambassadors and other people here. Track five is education and training. Track six is peace activism, people power. Track seven is religion. Track eight is funding. We always have difficulty raising money for peace. That inner circle applies to a number of you here. That's track nine, that's communication, that's the media, and beyond the media. My mantra is that the only way you solve a conflict is to sit down face to face and talk about it. When you put this all together, we call it a system, a systems approach to peace. And all of those nine tracks have to work together to build a peace process that will actually last. I thought I would talk briefly about three of our projects and how we, what we do and how we do it. Basically, we only go where we are invited to go by the people in a conflict, not by governments. We're a freestanding, standalone, I'm chairman and CEO of, of the Institute. We don't take orders from anybody. We work with the people. And so when we go there, we're not following the details of the US government. We're being, we are conscious of those, but we are working with the people because they've invited us to come and help them break through their stalemate. And what do we do? We go and we listen. Very few governments know how to listen. And then we ask people what their needs are. And governments will tell you what your needs are and they'll fix them for you, but we don't do that. We ask people what their needs are. And then we say we don't have money, but we have skills and we'd like to help you. And when that's agreed, we make a five-year commitment, five years, to every project we take on. It's not a weekend, it's not a month. These things take time. There's no magic wand out there, there's no magic bullet. They take time and energy and passion and some money to make these things happen. So I'm gonna talk briefly about Cyprus, about Kashmir, and about how we're working with the military in Washington, D.C. Cyprus was you know, a beautiful island in the Eastern Mediterranean. Became a nation when the British Empire was beginning to, to fall apart uh, in 1960. And they went through the Security Council, you know, to become a nation at the United Nations under the charter, there's only one path. One of the five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, Britain, France, China, Russia, and the United States, has to propose you and then all other four have to agree. So all five permanent members have to agree for you to become a nation. And then the whole Security Council has to agree. And then it goes to the General Assembly and two thirds of the nations of the world have to agree that you can become a nation. So that happened to Cyprus in 1960. And they had peace on their island for about four years. And then Greece got a little greedy, wanted to take over the island and there was a lot of ethnic cleansing, which is another word for killing people. The Security Council met in an emergency session and they sent a peacekeeping force there to try to keep the peace. Uh, most of them were Canadians. It was a very fine uh, effort on the part of Canada. And they stayed there on the Green Line at the Lidra Palace Hotel. And they stayed there for about 10 years. And then another attempted coup, and this time Turkey, sent in 35,000 troops. And there was a lot of killing back and forth. And finally, all of the Muslims moved to the north and all of the Christians moved to the south, where they lived in peace for a thousand years. 
but now they were divided, the green line, you couldn't cross it, you couldn't send a, a letter or make a phone call, totally isolated one side from the other, <clears throat> 1974. Well, track one began to try to help, but made no progress whatsoever. And finally, in 1992, well, track one making no impact whatsoever, we were invited on the island by several people. We went there, we got permission to go to the other side, we stayed there for three weeks, and we just listened, just listened for three weeks. And then we learned that both sides wanted help, and so we said, over, oh, we'll come back and raise some money and come back and help you. So we did that, and we came back, and we worked for 15 months separately with the Muslims in the north and the Christians in the south. And finally brought six from each side together after 15 months of working separately. We brought six from each side. We had a political leader from each side. We had a university president uh, like our chancellor here. Uh, we had a women peace activists. We had a lawyer. We had a journalist. We had a businessman. They never met before, but they worked with us they trusted us, and in an hour they bonded and became our steering committee for the rest of our time there. Over the next eight years, we trained 2,500 Cypriots together. When we started out, we were told you couldn't train two, they wouldn't ever work. And then we left the island, ran out of money. 2004, the then Deputy Prime Minister of the Turkish Muslim North, suddenly announced to the world he raised the gates and he urged the people to move back and forth across the, the Green Line, to visit their old homesteads, to see some of their former neighbors who are still alive. 5,000 people crossed the Green Line in the first 24 hours. Nobody was shot. Nobody was hurt. They were welcomed. Each side welcomed the other. In the next three months, 700,000 people crossed the Green Line. There are only a million people on the island. Who raised the gates? Who was the person that had the guts and the courage to raise the gates? It was that one of those six Muslims, that one political leader that we worked with over the years. But nine years later, he had the position, the power, and the guts to raise the gates and change the history of the island. So I estimate about nine million people have crossed back and forth since that date. Track one is still arguing about a peace treaty. We like to say we try to make the impossible possible. Our second case is Kashmir. Kashmir, you may remember, uh, was a part of the divi division when the British Empire was dividing up the subcontinent of India. And the idea was that all of the Muslims were to go to Pakistan and all of the uh, Hindus were supposed to go to India. There was a lot of violence at that particular time, but people moved back and forth. But every Maharaja of every state had the ability to determine which way to go. And the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, which had been around as, for 2,500 years as a culture, the Kashmiris had, decided at the last second to go with India when 85% of his population was Muslim. So that's the heart of the conflict. In 2000, uh, in, no, in 1995 it was, 1995, I was visited by two three-star generals, one from India and one from Pakistan. They were both retired, they'd been invited to Washington, D.C by the Stimson Center for a month. They met each other, heard about my institute, and came to see me. Again, like in Moscow, within two minutes after we met, the two generals asked me to solve the Kashmir problem. And I laughed and I said, I can't do that. Now, the, they were very serious men, however. They said, we have fought two wars against each other over Kashmir, and we don't want to fight a third war. And we think you, as a little NGO, might be able to help because our governments are not doing a thing about this conflict. Well, I, we didn't have any money, they didn't have any money, but I said, let me keep this on our radar screen. 
Two years went by when I was visited by a man from Bombay, India, uh, who had set up his own little NGO called Peace Initiatives to done some good work in Indian Kashmir. And we met and we talked and I finally said, why don't we try to work with Track 3, the business community? In 1988, there had been 800,000 tourists in Kashmir. Three months later, it was zero because of fear. The whole economy had collapsed, the tourism industry disappeared. I said, if we can convince business leaders of both sides to invest or reinvest over a five-year period, maybe we can help to build some peace there. He thought that was a great idea, invited me to Bombay to meet people there. The very next day, I was visited by a distinguished by the State Department Visitors Program, a distinguished political leader from Islamabad in Pakistan who was also had the Pepsi-Cola franchise in Lahore. Same discussion, same invitation, come to Pakistan and I'll introduce you. So eventually we came there and we put on trainings for business leaders in, in, uh, in New Delhi. Uh, 28 business leaders came together, three days, and then in Lahore, Pakistan, 50 business leaders came together. I'd also worked with Kashmiris who I'd met earlier before, and we wanted to bring all four groups together, but again, our funding ran out. But we have continued, and I want to tell you one of our great success stories. In 2000, when I was talking to a refugee camp outside of Masafrabad, the capital of Pakistan, Kashmir, a thousand refugees had fled from India for fear of their lives, and they briefed me, and then I briefed them, and then I came up with an idea. I said the year before, there had been a, what I call a politician's bus. Prime Minister of India went from Delhi by bus to Lahore and met with the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Then they issued the Lahore Declaration about Kashmir, but it, it fell apart a few months later. But they all remember that. I said, I want to start a, a people's bus, a people's bus just for the people of both sides to move back and forth. 95% have families on the other side they haven't seen in decades. And they thought that was a wonderful idea, so I came back to Washington. I didn't try to raise any money. I had an idea and I began to push it. Whenever I went back, made speeches in Pakistan and India and elsewhere. Much to my delight, three years later, in 2003, the Indian government issued a press release which somebody sent me. It was called Track 2 Diplomacy. Well, that was pretty good for my ego because that's for my phrase. And, uh, they had five ideas of confidence-building measures, is what they called. The third one was the people's bus. They'd taken my exact language, my whole idea, and made it their own, which was perfect because I could never raise the gates, but they had the power to do so. And so Pakistan agreed four days later, and so I thought this was going to happen. But my fellow diplomats in both countries got involved in what kind of passports or visas or UN stamps were needed, and they argued for a year. And finally, the president of Pakistan now and the prime minister of India ordered the foreign ministers to approve the people's bus. And on February 15, they announced the first bus would take place on April 7, 2005, exactly five years to the day after I had proposed that outside of Musafirabad. The prime minister of India, Sonia Gandhi, the head of the Congress party, flew up to Srinagar on the Indian side to wave goodbye to the bus. Prime Minister of Azad Kashmir in Pakistan met the bus. And for the first time in history, people moved back and forth. On the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the next day, a big, beautiful picture of 20 Pakistanis crossing over the rebuilt and renamed Peace Bridge into Indian Kashmir. I'm pleased to report that the People's Bus is still going to this very day. My third story, very briefly, is about the National Defense University, which I graduated from in 1967. In December of 2005, I was asked to lecture that uh, there, they give a master's degree on a 10-month program. It's the highest uh, training in, in, the, in the U.S. military, senior civilians. Uh, so there's colonels and, and senior civilians getting together. 
And uh, I asked if we could teach a course on conflict resolution and peace building. And the professor said, well, that's never been done before. <laughs> and I said, I know, that's why I'm asking if it's possible. I said, the goal of this, if you agree, the goal of this 10-week elective, 12-week elective project is to teach the colonels that there are other ways than the gun to solve conflict. It took a year and a half to get a three-star general to sign off on it. We started in January 2007. Last Tuesday, we finished our 10th semester. We have now graduated 143 colonels and senior civilians from 48 countries around the world. They now have a new idea that there are other ways than a gun to solve conflict. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that uh, very briefly, our goal is to bring people together to develop a more peaceful world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, for that presentation. And as you know, we have a few questions from our audience members that they'd like to ask of you. Where do you see the USA's most important diplomatic work to be over the next 10 years? And what do we need to do there? Wow. <laughs> you want me to write a book about that? <laughs> 10 years is a long time. I won't be around that long in the first place. <laughs> Well, I think our, our, uh, some of our current issues are certainly going to be with us for a while longer. Uh, our relation with Pakistan, one of our long-term allies, of course, is very precarious right now. Uh, and um, the whole debate that's going on currently is uh, about withdrawal from there and withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I think we have to pay a lot of attention to that part of the world. I must say I was delighted with President Obama's um, recent uh, suggestion that we strengthen our, our role in, in Asia. And I was delighted that Secretary Clinton visited Burma last week, which we have, and the world has ignored for good reason for all these many, many decades. So I really think the reactivation of our long-term interest in the Pacific Rim is, is uh, certainly going to stay with us for a long time, and I think that's a very important area for us to focus on. Um, I believe that the whole concept of terrorism is certainly going to be with us for a while longer, but I think we are really on top of that whole thing. There's a wonderful book uh, that I uh, read recently in which the author talks about the next hundred years, not just 10 years. And what he says for this century is that the United States will still be the one superpower for the rest of the century. I believe that. Ambassador, the EU is experiencing significant conflict over how to best deal with their financial future. This is typified by German nationals rejecting the Greek financial crisis and resentment at being asked to solve the Greeks' problems while the Greek populace reacts against cutbacks. How would you suggest they proceed to reach an agreement? Well, the, the, actually, on the 9th and 10th of this week, uh, the um, EU leaders are getting together to actually try to do that. So it's a very real problem in today's world. Mrs. Merkel, in my opinion, but Crystal disagrees with me because she's from Hamburg, Germany, <laughs> uh, I think is being a little too hard-nosed about uh, what her role might be. <laughs> and uh, I believe that um, the French and the Germans have just come up with an idea now that this part is, is, is good. Uh, they're going to set up an international institution to actually follow the finances of all of the members of the EU in a way that they have not done in the past. And I think that's an excellent idea and I fully support it. But that's going to take a while to do when there's an immediate crisis that they have to face in the very short term. Uh, my hope is that they'll agree to issue euro bonds and help uh, nations get out of the immediate crisis and then begin to uh, you know, exercise austerity as we're 
having to do in this country as well. But the leadership has changed in, in Greece and in Italy and in Spain in the last uh, six weeks. And I really believe that this is a very positive step forward on the part of the people of, of, of the Eurozone. So I am an optimist and I believe that they will be able to resolve this and that the Euro will remain intact and that the EU will remain intact as well. Ambassador, what inspired you to join the Foreign Service? Well, you know, I never thought about that before. <laughs> I, um, my dad was in the military, um, so I'm an army brat and I moved around the world with him. Um, when I um, went up for uh, joining the military, which I expected to do, I was declared 4F, which means you're not allowed to serve because I had, as a child, I had something called osteomyelitis. And in the law, it said if you had osteomyelitis, you couldn't join the military. They didn't have penicillin in those days. So um, when I was in law school, I was very unhappy about the fact that I had been turned down. So I, I left law school. I came to Chicago, Illinois, and joined Cuneo Press as a machinist in, a, in a, 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 an arms factory there. They converted. I was making armor-piercing bullets, became a setup man and a machinist uh, union, and then uh, the plant shut down. I became a Teamster, a member of the Teamsters Union. Everything bad you ever heard about the Teamsters is true. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> and uh, I really felt that I wanted to contribute to, um, to peace building. And so when um, I came back and finished law school, uh, in Urbana-Champaign, admitted to the bar in December of, of uh, 46 and was accepted uh, into the government as a diplomat. And my first post was Berlin, Germany. I arrived there in January 15, 1947. And so I've been involved in peace-building efforts, I guess, throughout my whole career. And I still love it. <laughs> What is the root cause of animosity toward the U.S. when most individuals still want to come to the United States? Well, there's a basic uh, lack of knowledge about the United States across the world. The people that know about the United States want to come here. Uh, the people who, like the people in, in, in uh, Karachi recently who were demonstrating against the, against the United States, they just don't understand what we have to offer them. Uh, and we have wonderful things to offer. And so when people realize that, that's when they want to come. I think also I'd like to put in a plug for the State Department International Visitors Program. As I said earlier today, the, that program I think is the best program the State Department has. They bring about 30,000 people every year from the third world to this country for three weeks just to let them see what its country is all about and take them around. They come here. Sometimes they go other places. I often lecture two groups when they want to talk about conflict resolution, learn about those skills. But that's a major way of letting people know about uh, this country. And I know a lot of those people want to come back here. So we have a great, um, amazing things to offer people like no other country in the world. To dovetail, dovetail off you what you just mentioned, uh, Rotary has several uh, individuals participating with students majoring in conflict resolution. Have you seen a difference in conflict resolution through this program or programs like these? Actually, I helped start that program in Rotary. Uh, I was a Rotarian when I was in Cairo, Egypt, but when I came back here I didn't have the time to do it, but I've always followed Rotarians. And I was asked about I mean, 10, 12 years ago to come out to Palm Springs, uh, California, where they had a major uh, Pacific Rim Conference. They were governors representing 2,500 Rotary Clubs from around the world. And during my talk there, I recommended a Rotary at that time that they start a conflict resolution program. And so I do believe that my input had a lot to do with, with Rotary scholars. We've had three Rotary fellows at my institute. Actually, since 1992, we've had 
280 interns from 65 countries, all getting their masters or PhDs in conflict resolution, attending as volunteers and unpaid attending our institute. And I should mention that last night at dinner, I urged our esteemed chancellor to consider setting up a master's program in conflict resolution here in Springfield on her campus. There is no master's program in the entire state of Illinois. And if this happens, this will be the first place to start it. And I've offered to send one of my people here, uh, just paying expenses, who set up master's programs in various places around the world to help get things started. So uh, I really believe that Rotary's on the right path, and I'm looking forward to welcoming the new program from our chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> Those potential students could start their uh, studies with the Illinois legislature, I believe. <laughs> I won't comment on that. <laughs> Before UN approval occurs, what qualities are necessary for a country to become a nation, i.e., what must be in place? Well, you have to have a defined geographical area. Uh, you have to have some history of nationhood coming together. Uh, you have to have uh, a political system set up that can take over a state. Uh, and when those things come together and the people really want this to happen, why then that's the first major step. Uh, now, in the case of Taiwan, which has all of the attributes of a nation state, they will never become a nation as long as the present government in China is in power because as a permanent member, they will veto membership uh, in, in the United Nations by that uh, beautiful country. So those are basically the criteria. And uh, I say from 51 to 193 have made it. And so it's a fairly standard concept of what we're talking about. <laughs> Now, I realize you may have previously alluded to this, but do you see yourself as pessimistic or optimistic that conflicts can be contained and that democracy can spread? I'm totally convinced that there's no such thing as an intractable conflict. I firmly believe that every conflict in the world can be resolved, including Israel and Palestine. But you have to have people involved from the grounds up in the process. This nine-track systems approach is serious stuff. It's got to be that way. No one track, including track one, in my experience, can create a peace process by itself. Now, they don't agree with me on that, but I'm just telling you from my experience, I may absolutely adamantly say no one track can bring about peace by itself. You have to work together. And I am an optimist, and I believe that all conflicts can be solved. Ambassador, thank you for being a fascinating edition of the Ambassador Series. Thank you. Thank you. thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us, and we hope that you'll join us for another edition of the Ambassador Series on WSCC. Good night. Ambassador Series is brought to you in part by Prairie Heart Institute, the University of Illinois at Springfield, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of this edition of the Ambassador Series, Send $24.95 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois, 62708. You may also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605. Be sure to include the program name, broadcast date, and topic.